Proverbs 5 then is what we're reading. We're working through our way through the first nine chapters as a sermon series. Uh, and this is, this is where we're up to uh, this morning. Proverbs chapter 5 then says this. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead, us, lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly, but she does not know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you lose your honour to others and your dignity to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich the house of another. At the end of your life, you will groan when your flesh and your body are spent. You will say how I hated discipline, how my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to my instructors and I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. Drink water from your own cistern running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always, may you ever be intoxicated with her love. Why, my son? Be intoxicated with another man's wife. Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your paths. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. The cords of their sins hold them fast. For lack of discipline, they will die, led astray by their own great folly. Uh, we live, don't we, in a hyper-sexualized world. There is no escaping it and no denying it. Uh, sex is used to sell everything, from cars to clothing. It's talked about, it's sung about, it's rapped about. Uh, kids are taught about it at a younger and younger age in schools. Um, we could take the uh, use of pornography, which is at epidemic proportions in society. Here's a shocking statistic for you. I had to read it twice to make sure it was true. Uh, this is from uh, a survey taken in 2007. So the chances are it's probably as bad or potentially worse now than it was then. Uh, 2007 found that 50% of Christian men and 20% of Christian women are addicted to pornography. That's profession Christians. Whether they're genuinely Christians or not, doesn't matter. They, they would say they were. Uh, and that's not the general population. And yes, it is an American survey, but before we try and explain it away as an American survey, remember what we learned last week? Every human heart has exactly the same problem. Doesn't matter where you're born on the planet, doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter the color of your skin, doesn't matter your age, you've all got the same heart problem, which is in here. Anyway, that was one statistic. If you want to find the survey, I'll give you the link for it. It was in a footnote in a book that I uh, read a while back. We also find in society today, don't we, that sexuality, for many people, is the core of their identity. Everything about who they would say they are is bound to their sexual identity, or so they think it is. And the confusion in our world around sexuality and gender is ever increasing. Even Kevin the Carrot is deliberately using words and phrases that have more than one meaning to promote Christmas at Aldi. If you've not seen the Aldi Christmas advert yet, you'll not know what I'm talking about. When you do see it, you'll know exactly what I mean. Okay? It's even infiltrating an innocent advert. Now, in the book of Proverbs, we've already met Woman Wisdom and Lady Folly in the chapters so far. Woman Wisdom, remember, is a picture of God's wisdom. So when we hear about this lady who brings wisdom or is wisdom or speaks wisdom, we're getting a picture of God's wisdom, but particularly what we're getting is a preview of Jesus Christ, in whom, Colossians 2 verse 3 tells us, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So whenever we think about wisdom, we've got to think about Jesus. 
Because all wisdom is hidden or found in him. But in this chapter, we're going to get another woman. Not woman wisdom, not lady folly. We meet the adulterous woman or the forbidden woman, depending on your translation. Now let me say from the outset, that doesn't mean Proverbs is anti-women. Uh, the, the writer of the Proverbs is not saying women are the problem. He's also not saying women are the solution. He's simply personifying temptation as an adulterous woman because he's addressing his son. Okay? That's why it's pictured as it is. The warnings we get later in the chapter about sexual temptation and sexual sin are as relevant to women as they are to men. Okay? Now the chapter opens in a familiar way. Uh, we've, we've had these father to son, right, listen to my instruction. Here it is again, beginning of, verse, uh, beginning of chapter 5, verse 1, my son, pay attention. Here is a dad calling upon his son to, to listen, to listen to the wisdom that he is seeking to pass on to him uh, and, and uh, listen to the understanding that he's gained over time. Why? Because, verse 2, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. But then the underlying reason is given for it in verse 3. Why does the son need to listen to his father and take on the wisdom that he's given? Because there is an adulterous woman. Now, if you were going to describe an adulterous woman and warn against her, I don't think the first thing you would mention would be her words. I think we'd expect some kind of sexy description of her physical appearance, what she's wearing, maybe a mention of her perfume or something like that. But here, the dad's warning to his son is, and from God to us is, about the woman's lips. Now that's not because culturally lips were seen as like the sign of, of a particularly beautiful woman that wasn't the centre of attraction in those days. This is about what is this woman saying? What is she speaking? What is the story that this adulterous woman is telling to this young man? Well, we get a description of the story, don't we, in, in terms of pictures. What is said is sweet. It drips with honey. Now, you can replace honey with whatever sweet thing you enjoy. Maybe Steve would replace it with Victoria Sponge, as we heard earlier. Maybe one of the rest of you might replace it with chocolate or sweets or, or whatever it might be. Honey was just the sweetest thing. That was the thing that, that, that it would have naturally. Okay, so if you don't like honey, don't think, well, this doesn't matter to me, okay? Whatever the sweet thing is that you most, that most get to you, you most struggle to resist, that's what it's saying here. The adulterous woman's lips drip with sweetness. And her speech, we find, is smoother than oil. We get the picture. What this woman is saying, it sounds good. It's enticing, it's attractive, it's seductive, and it promises much. Now that is true of sexual temptation. It's not all about what we see. The problem resides in our hearts. In sexual temptation, we're not just drawn to something because we see it as attractive. We're drawn to it because we think it offers us something that we don't have. That it offers us something better than what we've got. We, we, we begin to believe the lie that God is somehow holding out in us, that somehow God has failed to provide what we need. Sexual temptation, like any other temptation, is telling us a story, and it's claiming that its story is better than God's story. And we as human beings then begin to think, well, I've deserved this. I've worked really hard, or I've had a really bad week. It'll help me with all the negative feelings I have about myself. It'll make me feel better. Actually, this person is going to accept me for who I am. And yet this is not just true of sexual temptation. This is true of all temptation to sin. So think about the Garden of Eden. When Satan comes to Eve in the Garden of Eden, listen to how that temptation is described. Listen to the dialogue. Listen to the words. Verses 1 to 6, Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God 
nor in good and evil. Here's the key. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, see, she's listened to the words, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. It makes sense, doesn't it? Temptation wouldn't be, sorry, would be easy to resist and sin would be simple to walk away from if it wasn't attractive. We have to face that reality, don't we? Temptation is hard to resist because it offers us something attractive. Sin is hard to walk away from because it offers us something we want. If it didn't, life would be a breeze as a Christian, wouldn't it? But we know it's not. We could ignore it if it didn't sound and look good. If it didn't offer us something quick and easy. Now let's not be foolish and think, you know what, we're strong enough on our own. We can see through it now. Thanks, Mike, you've given us the warning. We can just see through it. We won't be duped. If that was the case, there would be no need for the repeated loving warnings of a dad to his son in Proverbs. There would be no need for our loving Heavenly Father to repeatedly warn us in his word. We would just need a little bit of willpower and all would be good. Temptation in reality is subtle and attractive and we are drawn into temptation of any kind because it appeals to our heart's desires. But what's the end? This is where the Proverbs are incredibly helpful and wise for us because here we're told the end. We're not just told avoid temptation, be aware it's attractive. We're told what happens in the end if we don't? It's like a spoiler for a film. Except this isn't there to ruin our experience. It's there to warn us and save us the heartache. Look at where the adulterous woman's sweet lips and smooth talk leads. In the end, verse 4, she is as bitter as gall and as sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She has no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly and she does not know it. Basically what she is speaking is all a bunch of hot air. It's a show, it's a veneer, it's a facade. It's all a front. Because the sweetness turns sour and the smoothness ends up sharp. And all of it. Because all sin leads to death. We don't need to test it for ourselves. We don't need to go, you know what, I'll just give it a go and see if these words are true. God's put them there so that we don't need to do that. Think about it. Online reviews nowadays are massively important, aren't they? If you happen to have run an online business, I don't know if any of you do, reviews are what you live and die by. The business rises and falls often by an online review. It's the same for people in trades. The reviews matter. Let's say you go on Amazon. Now, there are other stores and websites available. We're not having product placement this morning. Um, but wherever you go to do your shopping, let's say on the product you're looking at, there are a thousand reviews and every single one of them is a one-star review. What do you do? Well, you don't buy it, do you? You don't buy it. <laughs> you, everybody would think you're an idiot if you bought it. You don't think, you know what? A thousand people don't know what they're talking about. I'm sure this product can't be that bad. You just, you just wouldn't do it, would you? You, you think that well, would be madness. How much more then, when our loving Heavenly Father has clearly and graciously warned us exactly what temptation is like, exactly where sin leads to, when he tells us this is what happens in the end in verse 4, and again in verse 11 it's the same, why would we go, well, yeah, but other people say that it's fun. Other people say that it's harmless. And other people say that if I don't do it, I'm missing out. I'm being a bore. Who are we going to believe? Who are we going to believe? God, the maker of heaven and earth, who knows everything. Or other people who don't know everything. It's that stark of a contrast. Who are we going to believe? The Lord who has graciously warned us of where sin leads to, or the world who indulges in that sin and says, it's all right, don't worry about it. And if we're still wondering, we need to look at the examples in life that prove God's point. The world is full of them. 
we may well be living examples of ourselves and where we have fallen into sin and the consequences have been disastrous. Sin always seems like it will be fun. It always seems like and promises to give satisfaction, but that is always short term. It never, ever lasts. Think about the, the path that it is tracing out here in these verses. Think about the lad who starts off with a little bit of office flirtation, which leads to a lunch with one of his colleagues and a bit of emotional bonding. And before you know it, he ends up sleeping with his colleague, ruining his marriage and getting divorced. That's the picture that it, 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 it's speaking of here. Think about the lass who starts watching some pornography to get some hints and tips, she thinks, on how to be a better lover, but ends up never having any sexual experiences that live up to what she thinks she's seen online. Ruins her body, ruins her relationships. Think about the kid who smokes a joint to be one of the crew and ends up in debt and lives alone because his family don't want him around anymore. What seemed like a small thing to start with grows from that seed into a flower that is poisonous, deadly. Sadly, we will know people who fit those examples. Sadly, we may be one of those examples ourselves. In reality, what we learn from Proverbs here, what we learn from our own life experience and from the experiences of others is that to live for the moment and forget the consequences is foolishness. One of the commentators I read had this helpful line summarizing this. And he said this, this is a guy called Andy Prime, he said, the, the power of temptation is in hiding the end from you. The power of temptation is in hiding the end from you. Temptation says, look, this thing will be amazing. And we go, oh, wow, that looks great. But, but what it doesn't tell you is where it goes. What the end point of that is for you and everyone else around you. God, on the other hand, loves us and has graciously said to us, yes, temptation looks great. It looks brilliant. But you know what? I'll take away the front that it's put on. I'll sweep it aside for you and look. Look where it goes. He tells us it's there. We, we, we're going in eyes wide open if we listen to God's word. If we follow God's word, we can go into every temptation eyes wide open of where it leads. doesn't necessarily mean we're going to resist it because on our own we can't. But by God's strength and by God's spirit, we, we know the end. And if we rely on him, we can resist it. Because sin will promise to fill us, but will leave us empty. Sin will promise to satisfy us, but will always leave us wanting more. Sin promise us, promises us belonging, but will end, us leave, uh, end, us, end up with us feeling lonely. Sin promises to complete us, but leaves us broken. Sin promises to help us find ourselves, but actually leaves us lost. Sin promises joy, but only delivers despair. Sin promises peace, but only delivers destruction. Sin promises life, but only delivers death. And so instead of running off with the adulterous woman, we need to embrace woman wisdom. Because woman wisdom is our preview of Jesus. And we find, don't we, in the Bible that Jesus is the one who can truly satisfy. We were away this week as elders at um, the FIC conference and we were looking at the I am statements of Jesus in John's Gospel. Actually, the more I think about it now, and this is not in my notes, but just connecting the dots together. Actually, in what Jesus declares about himself, we see that he offers all that sin says it can or, or sin thinks it can. But Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Come to me, you'll never be hungry again. You'll be satisfied. Jesus offers the woman at the well living water and says, look, if you come to me, you'll never be thirsty again because I'll satisfy that thirst that is in your soul. Jesus is the light of the world who brings life and life to the full. Jesus is a good shepherd who brings us into his flock so that we know him, so that we aren't alone, so that he's always with us and so on and so forth. Only Jesus can give us the joy, the peace, the life, the hope, the satisfaction, the wholeness that we need. Nothing else can. 
That takes us through the first six verses. The bulk of the passage then from verses 7 to 20 instruct us particularly on how to truly enjoy our sexuality. And again, like much of Proverbs, we basically end up with two options. We've got the way of folly and destruction, or we've got the way of wisdom and satisfaction. Only two choices. Folly and destruction, or wisdom and satisfaction. And it starts by, again, the father addressing his sons, plural this time, to say, look, don't go anywhere near the adulterous woman. Don't go anywhere near her door. And if we've been Christians a long time, I'd say, oh man, this is where it just gets a bit legalistic, doesn't it? Or if you're not a Christian, you've only ever thought Christianity was about rules, you might be sat there going, see, exactly, exactly my point. It's just about a bunch of rules. We say we can understand the call not to commit adultery in the Ten Commandments. We can maybe understand that pornography is dangerous because, as neurologists have studied and said about it over time, it warps the brain. It literally reshapes the brain of the person viewing it. Studies show that. That's not me being, you know, using hyperbole to make you scared. Genuinely, that's what happens. Scientists have proven it. We also know that it fuels abuse and criminal organizations and so on and so forth. Okay, maybe a warning against that is fair enough. But do we really need to avoid anything related to the adulterous woman that drastically? Yes, we do. Otherwise God wouldn't have said it. That's the, that's the very bottom line of it. But the perfect example for this is Joseph. Sold as a slave, working in the house of an important man named Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. And what does he do? He runs. She grabs hold of his garment, pulls it off him. He has to run away naked. Why? Because he knows to give in to that, he loses everything. I mean, Joseph ends up in prison because part of his wife lies about him. And he gets put in prison. But God is at work through that. And Joseph's faithfulness to the Lord, in many senses, is honoured in that, isn't it? And eventually, if you know the story, Joseph is the one who saves the nation of Egypt from famine. Because God works in and through his life. The warning here in the Bible is that if you go down this road, if you embrace or entertain the adulterous woman, you will lose your dignity, your honour, your wealth. And physically, your own body will be ruined. That's what it says. And think about it. Think about the broken families. Think about the messy divorces. Think about the many and varied STDs in our world today. Why? Because people haven't fled the adulterous woman. In modern terms, that's what God is warning about here. Casual sexual encounters are not harmless because sexual sin is not harmless. And they all start, as we thought about with David uh, in 2 Samuel, if you've been here on an evening, they all start with a lingering look. They all start with listening to a lie. They all start with a so-called playful bit of flirting. And these verses here, uh, if anybody's an Oasis fan, Oasis family, it's saying, don't look back in anger. Solomon says to his sons here, don't look back in regret. Don't look back in regret. Do not think that you are immune from this. Do not ignore this advice, he says, and find yourself 5, 10, 15 years down the road living with deep regret. Don't be left thinking, if only I'd listened to God's word, if only I'd listened to the loving advice of my mother or father, if only I'd listened to the wise counsel of my friend, I wouldn't be in this mess. Because that's what he says here, doesn't he? At the end of your life, your body will grow. When your flesh and your body are spent, you will say, how I hated discipline, how my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear from my instructors, and I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. If we ignore the loving warnings of our Heavenly Father in his word, we will end up in spiritual trouble. That's verse 14, isn't it? If we ignore the gracious wisdom of God in his word, we will shipwreck our faith. Smartphones are incredibly powerful pieces of technology, aren't they? Some of you love them, some of you hate them. That's not the point. They're incredible, powerful pieces of technology, but they are incredibly fragile. Okay, I've managed to smash one phone twice, simply by dropping it on the floor. But imagine any smartphone, even if you think your smartphone's a bit more robust, imagine if you take your smartphone and try to hammer a nail in with it. What happens? A big mess, right? Shattered glass, damaged motherboard, it, it's, it's gone. You'd be an idiot to do it, wouldn't you? Lots of mess 
will follow. Our sexuality is an incredibly powerful and beautiful gift from God, but it is delicate. If we try and use it in a way that God has said it isn't designed to be used, a lot of mess will follow. Now, as I say that, I, I am aware that there are, what, 100 people in here this morning? I'm aware there will be lots of things for lots of people that the whole idea of sex and sexuality and gender and everything raises in your minds, personally and for other people you know. And I apologise now because, in reality, I can't, I can't cover them all this morning. We could spend an entire week on, on, on the variety of things that we might need to cover. So if there's something that personally for you is a real difficulty when we've read this chapter or from something I've said, please come and speak to me at the end. I will stay all day if needs be, if there are things you need to talk about. But just be aware, I'm not trying to avoid them in here, I just don't have time to tackle them all. All is not lost though, if we know we've sinned sexually, whether that's a long time in the past or whether that was this morning, for that matter. All is not lost and we'll come to the great hope of the gospel at the end to show why that's the case. But that's the end of the first half of that middle section. One writer summarises it as keep your hands off every other woman and says then the second half is actually keep your hands on your wife if you're married. Now when I read the bit after that, the verses from 15 to 20, I wonder whether some of you were blushing where you were sat. I wonder whether as I read verses 15 to 20, some of us were sat quite uncomfortably. Maybe we're sat there thinking, you know, I didn't think the Bible would say anything like that. Maybe you think it's not really a subject for discussion in church. Well, two things. One, the Bible does say it. And secondly, the church does need to talk about it. Okay? If that makes you uncomfortable, I am really sorry, but I am not avoiding it. We need to get over our embarrassment and discomfort because it's there. We have to wrestle with it. In reality, one of the things the Bible is teaching here, but it teaches throughout the rest of Scripture, is that God created sex, and sex is a great thing. God's not a prude, and we shouldn't be either. God created sex to be enjoyed between one man and one woman in marriage. That's the only place for sex. Again, you got questions about that, you need to come and speak to me afterwards. But that is the bottom line. And God wants those who are married then to enjoy his good gift. Solomon says to his sons, look, and God says to us, enjoy sex with your wife. The wife is then described as a well. Now in a culture where there was no running water, think about how valuable a well was. Right? We're used to just going into the kitchen or the bathroom, turning on a tap, fresh, cold, running water. They didn't have it. Think about then the value of a well. It is something to cherish, it is something to enjoy, it is something to celebrate. Notice the wife is not described as a disposable plastic cup to be used and dispensed with. She is described as a well. Husbands are called then to focus on their wives, but the same would be true the other way around. Don't let your eye wander, he says. Enjoy your wife and let her enjoy you. Or enjoy your husband and let him enjoy you. Unashamedly, these verses say, May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving door, a graceful dear. May her breasts satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. In other words, if you are married, keep the romance alive. Yes, circumstances will change. Things will look different over time. But if you are married, your spouse should be your standard of beauty. You shouldn't be expecting your spouse to live up to a different standard of beauty from outside. Notice the strength of the language as well. Be intoxicated with her love. And you hold on a minute. The Bible usually speaks about intoxication as a bad thing. Yes, it does. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible does say intoxication is wrong, but not here. Here, it is literally a picture that the husband and wife should be drunk on one another's love. That's what it's saying. Now again, this chapter doesn't really talk to us about singleness. And I know there are plenty of single people in our congregation. I notice this chapter also doesn't directly address those who would struggle against the desires of same-sex attraction. It simply says that sex is something to be enjoyed in marriage, 
which then therefore means for those two groups of people at least, this is not something they're able to enjoy. And, and I get that that is difficult, maybe to listen to or to read or to think about. But we do have to say that this is God's good design for sex within marriage, and we have to trust that. But we also need to realise that what this isn't saying is that that is the pinnacle of all enjoyment in life. Even within marriage, sex is not the ultimate thing. The enjoyment and satisfaction that every human being needs, married or unmarried, is found in the relationship with God himself. If you've got that, if you've got the relationship with God, you've got the best thing. And in eternity, your faithful living for him in this life, whatever it is you have to battle with and wrestle with in order to live a holy life, will be worth it. Again, if you want to chat to me more about that afterwards, please do so. We haven't had space or the time to cover it all this morning. But look at verses 21 to 23 as we close. These are last but not least. We're going to read them again just so we get the the full uh, force of what they're saying. Here's four, right? So four is there. In other words, this is the reason, almost the foundation, the underlying reason for the instructions that were given before. For your ways are in full view of the Lord and he examines all your paths. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them, the cords of their sins hold them fast, for lack of discipline they will die, led astray by their own great folly. The reason we need to listen to what the Lord says is because he knows everything, because he sees everything, and because he will rightly and justly judge everything. Nothing is hidden from the Lord's. We often don't we think we can cover up our sin. We often think we can hide it from people. People watch pornography alone and then they cover their tracks, they delete their internet history. If your husband or wife were in the room or your children, would you watch it? No. Same with an affair, receipts, a bin, diaries are filled with fake appointments. We don't want to be discovered. And if we thought somebody had seen us, we'd be mortified. These verses tell us that whether we think we've kept it a secret from everybody else on the planet, whether we think we've got away with it or not, is not the issue. The Lord knows, and the Lord sees, and the Lord judges. Nothing is hidden from him. But the reality, if you're a believer this morning, is even greater than that, isn't it? It's not just simply that the Lord sees and knows and judges but if you're a Christian the Lord is with you always you you carry Jesus with you wherever you go and whatever you do because the Holy Spirit lives in us doesn't he if we're Christians and when we sin in reality tying it back to the fact that this is not simply just about sexual sin when we sin in any way at all we are effectively committing spiritual adultery against the Lord while he's watching because we've chosen something else over him we've decided to believe someone or something else is going to give us something more or something better than God can and again what does it say in these verses sin then is enslaving the evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them the cords of their sins hold them fast sin grips us with no intention of letting us go And in the end, it leads to death. So what do we do with this? What do we do with it all? In reality, whoever we are, this is particularly the grown-ups, whoever we are, we are all sexual sinners, whether we're single or whether we're married. Whether we've been faithful to our spouse or committed adultery, whether we've watched pornography or even the thought of it turns our stomach, we are sexual sinners in some way, shape or form. I mean, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount takes it to, have you ever looked at a woman lustfully? Or, if you're a woman, have you ever looked at a man lustfully? The reality is, we all have to go yes. And therefore, we are all in some way sexual sinners. But what we've got to remember is that sexual sin is not the unforgivable sin. However small or great or frequent it might have been, or even still is, it's not the unforgivable sin. Whatever we've done can be forgiven by Jesus because his death on the cross is sufficient. Jesus didn't die for us once we got our stuff in order, did he? 
Romans 5, 6 to 11 says this, you see it just the right time. While we were still powerless, Christ died for what? The godly? No, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will any person, will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for in this. While we were still doing great, no, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more then shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's friends, no, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We were powerless, but we weren't just powerless. We were sinners, and we weren't just powerless sinners, we were God's enemies. And yet, Christ Jesus came and died for us in that state. That is how much God loves us, and that is what our situation required. Even when we deserved wrath and death, Jesus gave his life for us so we could be reconciled and live. What a saviour. So come to Jesus this morning. Come to him and turn from your sin and receive his forgiveness. Come to Jesus this morning and know his love, a love that truly and fully satisfies in a way that no other love ever can. Come to Jesus with your brokenness this morning and find that he can make you whole. He is willing and he is able. Because of the cross, God our Father is ready to embrace us and not shame us in our guilt, in our sinfulness. Because of Jesus we've got a home, an eternal home, where we will live with him forever. We can come to Jesus in all of our mess. We can come to him as we are and he can change us and make us new. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask this morning that where we're sat, even in the quiet moment now before we, we talk to others or have a variety of things maybe to do, we, we ask that in that stillness we might know your healing hand, your forgiveness on us. That we might know the love of Jesus, that you might flood our hearts and minds by your Spirit with the the reconciliation that is ours in Jesus, if we know and we love him. And maybe flood our hearts with the, the peace and the love and the satisfaction for those of us who've maybe want to come to Jesus for the first time and know the forgiveness for all of our sins. Father, please do that work, not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, but because you are gracious and merciful. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.